Hello. Hey, Alexis. Hi, Chris. I think we have Brian Cantrell on. Who else? I know Ben said he can't make it. Quinton is here. Give it another minute. All right, we have about five minutes past. Is uh, Brian, Grant, Camille, Jonathan, Ken, or Sam on the line? Brian Grant said he wasn't going to be able to be here today. OK. Scratch him out. Cool. Well, I mean, that's five minutes past. It's uh, enough time. So it's uh, in your camp, Alexa. So go for it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Uh, apologies for missing a call two weeks ago. We had to do some, uh, some hygiene. Um, let's press on with today's meeting, please. Next slide. So, um, yeah, I guess the, the, the clan, can you do the, the conference bit, Chris? I think you're the best person to do that. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, uh, we just held our conference, uh, KubeCon China, for the first time last week. So that was super exciting. Uh, thank you for Quinton for taking the time to show up, showing up and representing the TOC there. Um, we posted the videos online, so you should be able to see most of the talks uh, there on YouTube. Uh, Seattle is coming up uh, in a few weeks. Our flagship event is uh, uh, currently sold out. Um, so thanks, everyone, for... Uh, signing up, it's a little bit difficult to predict the, the, the demand of these things, but uh, I'm excited for us to having a great event uh, there. Um, the schedule's linked, uh, and we're also doing a BOF uh, at KubeCon Seattle to provide an avenue to get feedback uh, to the staff uh, based on the event. Let me know if there's any uh, questions. Okay. Cool, moving on, next slide. Move on, is it just me? I can only... No, no, next slide, I think Taylor. Taylor should be steering. Come on, Taylor. Can you not see the TLC oh, elections? No, no, there we go, you're there. Um, yeah, so this is just a reminder that 2019, all the events are confirmed and scheduled. Uh, we just opened up the CFP for Barcelona. So if you go to the KubeCon, CloudNativeCon Europe site for Barcelona, you'll see the CFP link. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so here's uh, just a reminder on the TOC election schedule. Uh, go to the next slide, Taylor. Um, we are currently in the nomination uh, period, which ends at the end of this month. Uh, essentially, every CNCF member has the ability to nominate up to two uh, folks during this process. Uh, and then there's a qualification period that happens where the governing board can vet these candidates, and then a formal election uh, is run Condorcet um, style. And then we have a, a new TOC on uh, January 29th, uh, seven of nine slots. Any questions here? Yeah, I had a question. I just want to clarify something, Chris. This is sure. uh, interesting. 
Um, sure. In the emails, can you clarify that it doesn't have to be a governing board member to nom nominate someone? It just needs to be a CNCF. Correct. And yeah, any CNCF member. I just sent an email this okay. morning, I believe. So yeah, if you have Thank any you. questions, feel free to reach out to me. Cool. And I'll send another reminder um, uh, next week also for Sorry, folks. One, one last question. Yep. By member, do we mean member company? Uh, member organization. Yeah, they have to be a CNCF okay. member. Okay. Cool. Uh, this is just a reminder for the backlog. Um, you know, always a good idea to kind of take a look at that and offer any assistance to the TOC on reviewing uh, proposals, uh, reviews, and so on as they go in. Um, next slide is the core, I think, uh, focus of today's meeting is the kind of category slash refresh of working groups. So Alexis, I'm going to go leave it to you to uh, bring this up. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this is something that we um, have sort of touched on before. Um, it comes about because we wanted to figure out a way to make uh, the CNCF TOC um, scale better at, in the presence of more, more projects, uh, make it easier for people to focus on specific areas and understand how they fit together, make, make it easier for the community to engage and add value, uh, and, and many other objectives besides that. Um, the core idea is to identify a set of categories such as observability or storage or security and then try and um, bootstrap up uh, dedicated efforts um, driven by the community, shepherded by the TOC and uh, other volunteers and assisted by the CNCF team, folks like Chris and Chris's team and his colleagues uh, in order to make us get more work done and add more value to users and make projects more successful and more attractive, make CNCF more attractive to those projects. So to that end, uh, a, a proposal has been drafted around the categories and working groups. If you click on the link, you'll see the proposal. Um, if you can't see it, shout, because it might not be. I think all the settings let you see it. I think I've set it up to be editable by um, anybody. So please don't go spamming the text if you, unless you have a very good reason for doing that. Um, it's had a quick pass from the voting members of the TOC, and I think the kind of basic ideas are there now, uh, ready for folks to jump in and start to contribute. Uh, you know, the we wanted to have a working session on this during today's call. Chris, actually, can you remind me how many how many TOC members are actually on the call? Right now, one second, I bolded. One, two, three. Three. Myself and you have Brian Cantrell and Quentin Hole. Okay, right. I'm also here. Hello, oh, Camille, hi. Camille got here late. All right, make that four. So, I um, mean, you know, the, the this is our first interaction between those four folks and uh, the wider TOC community. Um, have a quick look at the document and start to digest it, and then I think we'll just kick kick off with some questions and comments from people. Um, so I'm just going to give everybody a moment to, to, to read what's there. So the absolutely key idea dear here is uh, Lee is asking if SIGs plant working groups. Um, we originally called these category working groups, but felt that actually they, were, they had a very special purpose, which was quite similar to the SIGs in Kubernetes. So it was suggested to use the word SIG to describe the working group associated with a category. Um, so they're not, they're not getting rid of all the working groups, but some of the working groups like security and safe would morph into a SIG uh, to be associated with that category. But there could be other ad hoc working groups that might be short lived for other purposes. That's out of scope for today's discussion. Alexis, I, I just want to make it clear that uh, the, the current SIGs were actually put in place as, as uh, uh, sorry, the current working groups were put in place as working groups, as short-term 
um, yes. groupings to produce essentially white papers uh, or, or other defined things, which, which is quite different than the SIGs. So I don't think they necessarily turn into SIGs uh, or certainly not the current formation of the working group doesn't magically become a SIG. Um, right, we're gonna just basically reboot things like serverless and security and see, see, and see what we get. So yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not guaranteed at all to make. There's another concept that we're working on in developing um, more articulately, which is subproject, which is owned by SIG. So things like white papers could also be owned by a SIG as a subproject, or safe could be a subproject of a SIG kind of thing. More on that as we evolve the actual definitions in Kubernetes, and then of course the CNCF TOC can take or or develop something that fits their needs. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, if you can uh, have a look at, at the document where you get a chance, Sarah, it'd be great to get your input. Happy to. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, let's see. So, Alexis, this is Brian. I think this this looks really good. My only comment, such as it is, would be that I think experts um, in any given field um, often have the the bias of their particular experience and expertise. Um, I I may change that wording just slightly to clarify that that their responsibility is not to their particular technology or to their company, but to the to the broader special interest group. Um, because I, I, I wouldn't want us to um, be excluding people to be running SIGs because they happen to develop their expertise in a particular technology. I see. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that, you know, essentially, what, why, why are we doing this? I mean, the objectives are set out at, at the top of the document, but it's just become impossible for the core TOC membership to properly keep on top of everything as the CNCF has grown. And whilst we've made some headway with TOC contributors and the community, we're still, I think, you know, struggling to really, really scale and get organized. So this is an attempt to do that. And it represents, in a way, the sort of biggest change in how we work uh, for some time. Um, what we want to do is you know, retain the ability of the nine seat TOC to, um, to do things like vote in projects and to be um, to really focus on making sure that CNCF is doing a great job for the community and the users and education, but also to invite people to help. And for, for us, I think we've been talking about this. The most important thing to us is that the folks who are putting in the most time really understand what the CNCF is trying to do, what its mission is, and demonstrate a lot of integrity in terms of that mission. So we're worried that uh, a SIG or any kind of working group could become its own sort of political structure. And we think that would be a bad outcome. So we've tried in this initial structure to come up with a way to balance between um, sharing and retaining um, core control in the TOC, if that makes sense, which means that we're actively seeking people to, to show leadership in these SIGs who we think, you know, it would be people who we'd welcome into future TOCs uh, in, in, at another time, if that makes sense. So you don't need to be a category expert. You need to be somebody who deeply cares about the mission, deeply cares about the community, and is able to demonstrate balance and integrity in that process. So, uh, yeah, that, Alexis, oh, go ahead, sorry. That, that, Alexis, that's a perfect way of phrasing it. That, that I would just re replace the unbiased with, with exactly what you just said. With, with right, the, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was that was my wording, the unbiased, and I knew as I was writing that it was going to be controversial. And I totally agree with your sentiment, Brian. I just couldn't think of a short way of describing what we what we just said in a hundred words. But I think we can we can wordsmith to be better. On the plus side, this was recorded, so we can even tune up Alexis's words to be shorter. <laughs> uh, thanks. Not for, the, not for the first time, I might add. Um, okay, did someone else just speak up just at the same time as Brian before? Yeah, this is Matt Farina. Um, hey, Matt. You know, well, it might be interesting to put a purpose at the beginning of this, not just to get into technical and introduction, because I think what you're trying to say is you want to scale the contributions to the CNCF around the expertise, because as we see the CNCF 
growing, at least this is my two cents on it. We see the CNCF growing with the number of projects and things going on. There's there's more in expertise and knowledge and we want to be, have a place to scale that. And um, this is that opportunity to do it. And it's sort of reflective of how Kubernetes has been able to successfully do it, but with our own slant on it. Does that sound about right? Well, I'm typing, it sounds kind of okay. What do other people think? I think that's mostly item number five and six of your objectives there. Yeah, I mean, what, this one? Four nuts, five and six, sorry. I can't even count. Mm. I, I, mean, I think also what, what we have found is, is that the surface area is now so broad that um, we require depth in so many different domains that we need to have the ability to delegate that depth. As at least what I say um, is that I think that there are, you know, so many projects that that come up for you know incubation or other kind of feedback to the CNCF TOC, and they are. I'm not able to provide feedback for them because they're simply not in my. They're they're a deep technical project that's not my area of expertise. I don't particularly. I don't personally use. So the SIGs I think allow us to delegate some of that delegate where people can get really good technical feedback and guidance from people that have been effectively delegated by the TOC. And then when those projects are deemed kind of a, a ready or appropriate by the SIGs, we as a TOC can have more confidence and more background in terms of what they actually are. That's my perspective anyway. Hey, Alexis, this is uh, Pratik Water from uh, Intuit here. Hello. Hey there. Hey, I had a just a quick rough question, which is, uh, would would there be a disconnect between uh, this SIG and uh, an appropriate Kubernetes SIG? And how do we make sure that uh, we don't create a parallel working structure or parallel ideas? Mm, very interesting question. So um, let me try and answer that. I'm not sure if I'll get it right. Um, I think the Kubernetes SIG is focused on extending Kubernetes with functionality reflected in the SIG. Um, so for example, I, I don't remember what the names are of the pieces of Kubernetes that deal with monitoring, but I'm aware that there are recommendations about how to monitor Kubernetes and, and making sure that it's possible to do that. Um, in this CNCF, we might have an observability SIG, which included um, projects, you know, they, it was there to uh, pay attention to the area to which Prometheus, FluentD, and other uh, monitoring, logging, visualization pieces, debugging pieces live. So um, I think that, you know, white papers on the structure of the space, um, useful pictures for users to understand what is going on could be deliverables, uh, as opposed to necessarily getting into the innovative individual uh, projects and how they're run. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And I'm just looking at Chris's uh, comments here where he says that the scope of the uh, CNCF working groups is uh, broader than the Kubernetes. Uh, I, I agree with that. I agree with the overall philosophy. I'm just wondering, you know, how do we prevent confusion? So, well, I hope... We can take it offline. That's fine. No, no, it's a very good question. Yeah. I think one of the key jobs of the SIGs is to help us to educate and reduce confusion. So, so I can even, this is Matt again, I can bring up an example here that may even uh, really touch on this. We have Kubernetes SIG apps, and we have talked about things that are very specific to extending Kubernetes, but also lots of related tools that help people because SIG apps just wanted to encourage that app developer and app operator space. But over here, I see we have a category for something like app definition and, and development. And so since there is that broader space and SIG apps has definitely touched on it in Kubernetes, there's definitely going to be overlapping effort at the CNCF. And so I figure we need to probably resolve that. Um, and it'll just be a case maybe where the Kubernetes SIG and the other SIG need to, to talk and figure it out. I, I don't know. But there, there are spaces where we are going to have that because Kubernetes SIGs have gone just beyond extending Kubernetes to try to enable the space as a whole, which I think is what the CNCF wants to do. Yeah, that 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 was actually going to be my uh, you know question because there are some work some SIGs which have gone beyond Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. So if if you start just thinking about like service mesh or you know uh, these areas are going to be broader than just Kubernetes. Right? 
So, so right. you may, I guess, I, I don't have an answer. I was just asking a question. Totally. Yeah. So, uh, Go on. Yeah, this is Angel from the uh, Safe Working Group. Uh, you know, so, so we have uh, an example in our group that uh, is, is actually the uh, Kubernetes Policy Working Group. Uh, you know, as they were looking to extend beyond, uh, you know, what they were doing, uh, they decided. Uh, well, actually, at first they 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 drafted a proposal to go to the CNCF, and then they looked at that, and the, this looks awfully like safe. Uh, maybe we should just join forces uh, with that working group, and yeah, you know, we became a a, a larger body uh, because of that, and incorporated their interests. <clears throat> Could I expand on this a little bit as well? Sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. No. Um. I. I think that um, any SIG in Kubernetes that's working on anything that looks like a pluggable or extendable interface is going to almost by definition extend outside the Kubernetes project, whether it's scheduler, CSI, OSI, CNI, like take your pick. So. I think, um, I, I don't see this as conflicted though. I just see it as a, like there's already these great touch points for the Kubernetes SIGs to work hand in hand with the CNCF SIGs. So I think this is a positive thing, not a, not a conflicted thing. I agree with Bob. I think the only real risk is if they're named exactly the same thing, we are going to come up with crazy, crazy um, confusion on naming. So if there are two SIG apps, one of which is a CNCF, one of which is a Kubernetes, then we are going to um, add further madness to a space that is already uh, a bit wonky. Yeah. yeah. I also gave some thought to that, um, and I think it applies generally to to the term SIG, uh, not not necessarily to the individual SIGs, and we're going to have this confusion. You know, one simple we did consider calling them something completely different, but then you know they they do fulfill a very similar function to the SIGs in Kubernetes, so that would create a different kind of confusion. Uh, one option is to just call them CNCF SIGs and never use the word SIG without the word CNCF on the front of it, uh, in the context of these SIGs, uh, and you know potentially encourage Kubernetes to call them K Kubernetes SIGs. Just a thought. Yeah. Kate SIGs would work, and then we just articulate each time which one, which type of thing we are speaking about, and that would make sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do we need to update the document to reflect this insight? Um, yes. I think it's a good idea to j just make clear that we we know that we need to make a distinction here, um, and that there there will be some groups that overlap. I also think there'll be some SIGs that don't overlap at all, or the, there'll be some SIGs that when they're their Kubernetes SIGs are solely focused on that attribute as as it pertains to Kubernetes. I'm obviously thinking of observability in particular, where the observability technologies are really orthogonal to Kubernetes itself. Okay, I'm typing. I'm, anyone else wanna keep, keep pressing on with questions as, and comments? From... Is the use of the term SIG here to help kind of reboot working groups, or and if that is, is that is that uh, critical and needed, or or just if if we if working groups themselves are revised but continue to use that label, there is no confusion to the extent that the labels are distinct. Sorry, was your proposal that, that we call these things working groups instead of SIGs? Uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, not, not um, you know, no, um, no special affinity with working groups, but just maybe just to the extent that we're able to I, find a different label that isn't, that doesn't require, a, you know. Um, yeah, we, we, we did actually consider that. So, so Kubernetes has these two distinct concepts, one being a, a SIG, which is a long lived thing, which basically lives for the life time of Kubernetes and unless it you know fails in some way and it has long-term responsibility for code and projects um, and and a, and a fairly broad area and and that is distinct from a Kubernetes working group which is a very specific group of people put together for a finite period of time to solve a you know predetermined problem so produce a white paper or you know figure out how to do Windows conformance or whatever the case may be um, so those are two, you know, quite distinct kinds of 
entities. And, and these things we're talking about are long lived. So they live forever, basically. And they're responsible for all of the projects that fall within that area, whether it's, you know, observability or storage or networking or whatever. We envisage that within each of those SIGs, there will also be working groups that are spawned to solve specific problems within the ambit of that SIG, or perhaps in some cases, crossing SIGs. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, yeah, it sure does. Um, I, you know, I think at first blush, if, or particularly makes sense if um, that's the way in which um, Kubernetes SIGs um, are, have been run and are understood, and, and that through that understanding, the use of the term SIG, uh, CNCF SIG, um, just helps people have a, the right frame of reference to begin with, and that makes that reinforces the notion that you'd use SIG as a term, as opposed to committee or you know, you know, or whatever else you'd call it. Yeah. And also, just SIG long predates Kubernetes. I mean, that's a, that's an ACM ism that I actually like. I, I like us tacking into that um, because I think that the ACM SIGs actually are an analog for what we're trying to do. Makes sense. Okay. Right. Anybody else? Good. Okay. So I think we've exhausted the initial discussion on this. Um, the next step is for folks on the community call, this today's call, and uh, you know, if you have friends who care about this, let them know, to have a look at this document, work on it together over the next uh, two weeks, and we'll see if we can get to a, a revised version in time for the next TOC call. It's not a promise, but it'll evolve along the lines of the sandbox document, which took a few goes to get right. Um, in the case of the sandbox, it wasn't until quite late in the process that we that we realized some quite crucial stuff had been missed out. So, you know, be, please do uh, keep making an effort to, to, to make this, this document better. Uh, we really, really do want this to work well for everybody. Good. Okay. Can we move on to the next slide, please, now, um, Taylor? And someone, there we go. Chris, this is your section. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to kind of go over this uh, fairly quick. I sent them out to the mailing list, uh, uh, I think it's been a few, a few weeks ago, but happy to go over it quickly. And then we have some graduation reviews um, that uh, kind of want to have the option to present. So I'll go over this fairly quickly. Um, so we survey our maintainer community uh, twice a year. Um, and so uh, we did this uh, recently and we've kind of collated the resort <coughs> results for uh, this year. Um, overall, our maintainer satisfaction is uh, 4.2 out of 5 on kind of a five point scale, which is a slight increase from each uh, half one of uh, 2018. Um, this time around, we also got 100% of our uh, response rate from uh, project representation. So each project had at least someone respond. Uh, and then this was a new question that was uh, brought up by Alexis and the TOC that uh, large majority of maintainers would recommend CNCF as a home for um, other projects. So that's the overall kind of uh, quick um, executive summary. Um, the next few slides kind of go over each kind of detail and uh, question that we asked. Um, but this uh, kind of main takeaways that at least uh, I had from this was uh, CNCF projects are mostly asking for support kind of in three uh, major areas. The first one is around kind of technical documentation, website uh, help. Um, other one is around just um, marketing, help us, you know, write a blog post or a technical article, technical blog. And the other one is around uh, events. Hey, uh, help us host a, you know, Envoy Con or GRPC conference. Uh, Etc. So um, that's kind of my overall takeaways uh, for here, and we've um, properly 
uh, staffed up recently on the technical writer side um, of the house, and we continue to serve our project maintainers uh, with events uh, like Envoy Con, GRPC Con, and, and so on. So um, I don't want to dive into each specific uh, question that kind of goes on the next few slides, but um, uh, I think on slide 20, we have some of the comments, um, you know, as has CNCF reset for projects, do you understand help, response time, uh, and so on. But slide 20 kind of uh, shows some quotes uh, from uh, maintainers in terms of their thoughts. So uh, before um, we go on to the graduation reviews, does anyone have any questions for me on this? We plan to do this uh, twice, uh, at least twice uh, a year, and we'll be kicking off the next uh, survey in, in late January. Any other questions? Otherwise, um, look forward to the next survey being launched in January. Cool. Is uh, Container D here? Phil? Yes, I'm here awesome. as well as Michael. So oh, lovely. Okay. Feel free to steer away. Go for it. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so I. Chris said we have about five minutes. I may even beat that if you're yeah. lucky. Um, no worries. So, yeah, I, I think I, I'm not going to walk through the exact um, checklist of TOC graduation criteria. Uh, the PR is linked, and I think uh, I assume many people have seen it. Uh, at the end, obviously, if there are specific questions about uh, checking off items on the list. We can discuss that, but I'll mainly stay somewhat high level. Uh, I assume many people have heard of Container D. Um, we w joined the CNCF uh, at the Berlin uh, KubeCon just last spring. Um, the goal being uh, to have this core container runtime uh, for both Docker and Kubernetes uh, to have this sort of boring, stable, infrastructure runtime under, uh, under which both could, could then innovate. Um, our key tenants uh, have really been, uh, again, thinking about this being boring infrastructure, is having uh, a, a strong focus on reliability, stability uh, of that core runtime. Again, we're built on top of OCI's uh, run C. So again, our goal is not to add a bunch of functionality around that, but to simply uh, have a strong guarantee uh, of lifecycle control over run C launched uh, containers. Around that, we've built a, a really uh, nice client API that means uh, from Golang or gRPC, pe people can build other interesting things, not just Docker and Kubernetes. And so you can see a few tweets here uh, of people who have found that uh, very interesting and, and in our project use uh, list, which we'll look at on the last slide. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, outside of the Docker and Kubernetes use cases, there are others uh, finding this API very uh, valuable and interesting. Uh, so that's a nice bonus as well. Um, we've also added uh, strong compatibility guarantees, uh, backporting fixes, so having uh, long-term releases that are supported um, in a very stable and uh, and reliable way. And then performance obviously is another uh, key tenant. Uh, next slide. Um, our community, um, I, I believe, has, has been very healthy and it has grown, uh, especially even this year. Um, I, I think one of the nice things about the graph, it's a little bit small, but obviously you can go to the CNCF uh, data. And I think one of the, the nice things about um, that graph is that over time, the expansion of actual committers has grown quite a bit. Instead of a few people doing significant amount of the work, uh, we have a, a, a lot more activity from new um, contributors. Uh, we do have 12 maintainers across eight organizations. That's listed a little more uh, in a detailed way in the PR. Um, we have uh, a reviewer category. They're allowed to LGTM. Uh, but not merge, and so that list has been growing. And again, if you're interested in stars and Twitter followers and all that, 
uh, obviously, um, again, there seems to be a healthy interest and in community that's come up around uh, container D. Uh, last slide. So again, um, you know, obviously the goal would be that container D would grow in usage. And so uh, today we have two public clouds who are offering container D as the Kubernetes runtime. So IBM Cloud and Google. Uh, so GKE and IBM are both offering recent versions of Kubernetes with container D as the runtime. Uh, Alibaba Cloud, uh, we, several of us just met with some of the teams from that organization last week in Shanghai, their pouch container project is built around container D. Uh, you can see other uh, uses as well, but uh, again, we see um, a significant growth in interest and usage of container D and the graduation proposal has a, a more extensive list of projects that are using uh, container D. So, with that, I'm a little bit under five minutes, and so I'll stop there and see if there are any specific questions we can answer. This, this may be more of a Kubernetes question than a container D question, um, but do you have a view as to when container D might, uh, might or if, or might or uh, uh, will become a, a default runtime for, uh, Kubernetes, I, I don't believe the Kubernetes project tests it as a feature blocking. It's not a release blocking compatibility. It's kind of tested after the fact. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting question that I think relates more to um, what, what would we see as the default because there's obviously multiple ways to install a Kubernetes cluster. And so it would depend on which path people are taking to claim that uh, container D is the default. Uh, I, I really mean the question is not intended towards installers. The question is intended towards um, upstream testing. Like what, what is required to actually qualify a Kubernetes release? Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a good view of that. So I don't know if there's anyone else on that, that could, could respond to that. I don't know how it works as far as on the Kubernetes side, but uh, at least on the container D side, we we have the node and in tests running on all the CRI PRs, so we, so we can catch issues early in our own testing cycle. Um, it's also container D is also tested in the upstream Kubernetes tests, uh, as far as I know. So um, we don't. I don't think there's anyone on the call who's worked directly on that. But as far as I know, we have. Um, it's a first class test target for Kubernetes at the moment as well. I, I don't believe that it is. I believe yeah. it is tested after. In other words, uh, a regression would not cause Kubernetes or, as a release not to ship. It would, it would obviously be something the container D uh, community would, would react to. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm actually very supportive of getting container D to that state. So um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I okay, think there's still work to be done there. Yeah. I, I thought we were definitely trying to work towards that, but I don't know. I, I only know of this indirectly, so I'm not the best person to answer it. Yeah, I think we could definitely take that as a follow-up and find the right folks to have that discussion with. Uh, I had a question. Um, could you just give us a, an understanding of, of how much of uh, container D is exposed to applications in a Kubernetes cluster? So. To what extent can, can applications and containers be oblivious of whether it's container D or, or some other CRI compliant uh, runtime underneath? Yeah, so, so effectively the goal of the CRI was to, to make um, any use of the Kubernetes API, any pure use of the API should be agnostic to the runtime. Um, obviously any application which decides it needs to inspect the host, you know, either through, you know, sharing uh, namespaces with the host or trying to interact with the underlying runtime, um, obviously will care, uh, but, but an application which purely uses the Kubernetes API should have no uh, concern or, or effectively no problem with being agnostic to the underlying runtime. Uh, 
Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Chris, what's the process step here? Uh, if the TSC is comfortable uh, with container D here uh, I, uh, to go for a vote, a formal vote, then I will kick it off. If not, um, we hold. So it's up to you. There's no I'm issues concerned with... That, yeah, go okay, ahead. thanks. I, that's good. Um, just trying to be quick on time. Um, with only four of us on the call, uh, we should probably put it onto the email on, onto the email list to allow also Brian Grant to speak. Sure. Yep. I think I'd like to um, just make sure that from Brian's and your perspective, uh, we understand how the actual graduation criteria have been met. Um, personally, um, I'm very impressed with the progress made by the project. Anyone else want to say anything or we can move on to the next project? Yeah, I also feel very comfortable, uh, but I would. it would be good to have uh, at least one TOC member, perhaps the original sponsor, and don't remember yep. who was. It was, it was Brian. Do a due diligence. Yeah. yeah, Brian Grant is 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 the owner of all of this, so he unfortunately couldn't make it today. Yep. Um, but I'd like to hear from him, please. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll send a note out to the mailing list. I think he isn't supportive of moving forward, but I'll give him a chance to say that in public. Okay, let's move on to the next one. I'm actually going to have to drop off in a sec. So I've got to run across town to a meeting. Um, tough. Who's going to talk about tough? Sounds good. Um, yeah, if someone can go to the next slide, please. Dan. Oh, it's Perfect. Justin. Justin. Yes, yes. Oh, hi, Justin. This is Justin Capos. Uh, so yeah, so just a quick reminder for those of you. So tough is uh, the way in which software gets distributed uh, largely across a bunch of domains, including the cloud, that's resilient against server and key compromises. So it's a framework that makes it so that even if people break into different parts of your infrastructure, uh, different, you know, you're signing uh, your, your repository or other aspects of your cloud infrastructure, um, it's meant to resist this. So we're, we're something of the, the plumber's plumbing. So uh, I know a lot of, you know, basically what's being done here in the cloud is, is basically plumbing for the services of, of the future. And we're, or even kind of, you know, just the boring underneath uh, part under that. Uh, so Tuff has multiple roles. It has a bunch of issues with, uh, you know, it uses to provide security, a bunch of things like threshold signatures, uh, selective delegation, supports HSMs and TPMs and so on. And there's a couple of things that Tuff does that makes it fairly invisible under the, un, under the surface. Um, it's intentionally meant to be very easy to drop into existing workflows. And so uh, apart from maybe needing someone to sign something they didn't, they didn't uh, sign before, you know, which it can be as easy as just making a change to a script or having them use a YubiKey, Tough is meant to be very invisible. Um, there's often a one-time initial setup uh, cost of having to make a couple changes somewhere in the way you sign and build things, but it's very um, meant to be very uh, transparent and, and easy to use. Uh, and it has a very strong security focus. So there's minimal design with this, or sorry, there's a minimal, intentionally minimal design. We're not trying to grow and add and have every possible feature. Uh, and it's meant to be low churn for those who go and uh, implement the system. So the history of this is uh, back in 2010, I had some folks from the Tor project that, that came uh, to visit after they'd seen some work we'd done on security for Linux package managers and saw there were a bunch of issues with uh, that we pointed out there that also applied to the Tor updater. Um, and they spent a little bit of time, did a bit of a design and went away and huddled and then created a design that um, we found some issues with. So we built on that and, and made a different version of it uh, that, that was tough. My, myself and an undergraduate who was working with me. Uh, we were admitted to the CNCF in 2017 along with Notary. Notary, uh, which uh, was created by Docker, is the most widely used implementation of Tuff inside of the cloud um, and is, is one of the most popular uh, implementations of Tuff overall. 
TUF itself as a project has a formal process uh, for changing the standard because we are meant to be very low churn and have a very simple minimal design. Uh, so there's a process called a TAP process. And this is perhaps one of the biggest distinctions between TUF and a lot of the other CNCF projects is that um, we don't directly interact with a lot of uh, the people that adopt TUF. They mostly interact with whichever implementation of TUF uh, they've, they've gone and integrated. Um, if they use a reference implementation as some, impl some integrators have, then we've actually communicated with them. But uh, oftentimes uh, I will find out that we have a new tough deployment because I'll hear something from the notary team or hear something from another team uh, in a different domain that's gone and done this. Uh, and I'll talk about some of those other domains uh, in I think the next slide. So next slide. All right, so uh, tough is used in uh, a lot of cloud, a lot of the large cloud uh, companies as you can see uh, a list there have gone and used this. If you go and click on the adoptions link that's on the bottom of the slide uh, and you click on any of the company logos and things, it'll take you to the articles and discussion about how they use it and, and what they do. Most of the cloud users, um, with a few exceptions, uh, use Notary, which is our, our most popular implementation in the cloud, um, which uh, David, um, David Lawrence, uh, um, uh, the other Justin, Justin Cormack, and others uh, spend an enormous time working on. There's actually quite a lot of automotive use of the tough variant uh, Uptane. Uh, the automotive industry, for those of you who are not in the know, it's extraordinarily secretive. So we go to automotive conferences and people come up to us in the hallway and say, you can't tell anybody this, but come look at this demo. We're actually using Uptane here. And I don't really understand why that is. It's very counter to the way that most of the open source community is, but we can't talk openly about which of like, for instance, which of the big three US automakers uses, uh, is, is using Uptane in their new models or which um, you know, large Asian automotive uh, manufacturer, manufacturers are doing so. But I can say you know, from the things that are public, we're part of automotive grade Linux, and uh, about a third of the new cars sold in the United States are gonna be including Uptane in the future. Uh, we also have use outside of cloud uh, for different projects that are not uh, cloud projects that are using, using tough from different environments. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so we have a lot of different committers that, that uh, go and work on different aspects. The most interesting aspect here is really this the specification. So these are just different implementations here. The Python reference implementation has um, a collection of folks as do the does notary. Um, there's a, about six other implementations that are done by different organizations. Some are open source, some are closed source. Some are things that uh, we can't really talk publicly about, but we can talk about and, and point to quite a few of them if there's interest. The specification itself is fairly low churn. We try to be pretty protective about adding or changing things in the spec uh, so that uh, our implementations can be low churn as, as you know, is ideal with security software. Next slide. So the real way to look at, uh, tough, uh, at tough is really to look at the taps, to look at the changes to the specification. Because once again, we're a little atypical in that we're mostly um, sort of the a specification rather than a piece of software that's directly used, although people do use our Python reference implementation in, in uh, production. So we have had um, in the last uh, year and a half or so, or two years or something, we've had a bunch of accepted taps. We have several under consideration. In fact, I think there've been some additions to this since we've had this conversation and have had a lot of um, folks both from cloud native, projects and also um, outside projects that are both, um, you know, automotive and, and broad uh, go and produce things here. Um, there have been uh, a bunch of activity on this. So uh, 10 different uh, contributors with 500 something commits, which is a lot for something like standards documents. Uh, some of these have been things like as simple as, as typo fixes or other things, but a lot of them have been uh, just, you know, more substantial clarifications uh, you, you can see this, uh, you can see with the changes to the specification, uh, Notary and, and the Python reference implementation have also had a healthy set of commits and contributors participate in them. Uh, next slide. Uh, and, you know, the last slide I have here, I just want to say we've, of course, uh, done all the things that we're supposed to do as part of this. We've adopted CNCF a code of conduct. 
And uh, you can read for more information about our uh, governance and contributor process adopters list. Uh, one last thing I'd like to kind of leave people with is, is that we have both the passing in silver and we're almost all the way to the gold badge for CII best practices. And I just wanna encourage everybody on the call, if you have an open source project, CII best practices is a, is a really um, helpful process to go through. Um, and I encourage you to, to take it and, and get not just the passing badge if you can on your, on your projects, but to really take it further. Um, it's, it's a fantastic project and one that we're, we're happy to be working with and happy to have benefited from. So uh, that's it for me. That's the last tough slide. I'm happy to cool. take questions if we have a moment. Cool, yeah, thank you, Justin. We definitely have time for uh, questions. Any folks from the TOC or community want to ask Justin some questions? This is Matt Farina, I'll bite. Um, I noticed that the current version of the spec is a 0.9, and it looks like the markdown file has a 1.0 draft. Is there movement towards a 1.0 coming soonish? Maybe as part of graduation or? Yeah, we, we've been very it. happy. Um, it's one of these things that we've kind of stared at it so long we didn't notice we had the draft designation on there. And so um, we're, we would like to do this. Um, there are two taps that we have that we were considering um, whether they should be in a 1.0 or whether they should be in the next iteration, the two taps that are pending. Um, but we're, we're basically ready to bump that. Uh, to bump that number because really all of our main adopters are on uh, on or, or near the um, the functionality that does not include those tabs. So yeah, we're, we're ready to, to bump to that. Any other questions? I just had a very brief observation. Um, I went through some of the tough, uh, the, the proposal, et cetera. It's, it's kind of blurry, the distinction between the standard, the specification, the reference implementation, and notary. Um, and I quite often find myself wondering, which of these things are you actually talking about here? So uh, more, more like constructive feedback than a question. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to disambiguate any of that to the extent I can. Um, if you'd like to, I, I'd be happy to follow up with you and I can make a pass myself, but if you spot anything else that could be clarified uh, after that, then would love to hear. To clarify, this proposal is for graduation of TAF. Um, we'd like to do um, graduation of notary um, in, in the future as well. They're, they're independent projects as far as CNCF is, CNCF is concerned, even though they were brought on at the same time. Um, Any other questions for the folks? All right, I will um, thank Justin for his time. I'll shoot another email uh, to the TOC list asking for more feedback. Um, generally, our approach has been asking the original TOC sponsor to kind of um, support this request, but in this case, this was Solomon. So um, we'll uh, figure out if we get a current TOC member to shepherd uh, this along to do the formal call for vote. So uh, thank you, Justin, and uh, the tough and, and notary folks on the call for uh, presenting. Cool, I think we're a little bit tight on time. Three minutes will be a little bit tough. I don't know if uh, Core DNS uh, is on the call, but um, you know we're happy to give you time uh, next week. Because Francois, yes, I was expecting to present, but maybe next week, next time, you mean in two weeks? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, not next week, next, next time. So okay. it'll be first week of December, so. Um, yeah, I just don't think it's uh, fair to you to only have two minutes and fair to people who uh, have a meeting next. So uh, sorry about that. 
uh, Francois, but um, hopefully we'll get you definitely scheduled next time around, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, cool. Awesome, and then Ken, Ken answered the question on the uh, tough uh, uh, issue since he's uh, uh, doing some work with it at MasterCard, so uh, I'll, I'll work with Ken um, offline to, to get him uh, pushing that forward. So other than that, thanks everyone for their time, and uh, we'll see you in a, a couple weeks, first week of December. All right, take care. Thanks.